all, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming here. And thank you, Pearl Halego, who is here, for introducing me to this wonderful choir that you're going to hear today from Temple Beth Shalom in Roslyn. Uh, we decided in putting this together that we wanted to take a different tact, and everybody says, Arthur, the, you're the youngest guy I see here, and I'm 70. So they said, let's really get some nice young kids in. And we have this wonderful group that's in here today, and we really appreciate it. And you will appreciate it even more as we get into today's program. Uh, in 1865 in Washington, D.C., when the Civil War was coming to an end, Abraham Lincoln and his wife decided to loosen up a little, get out from all the tension they had been facing for almost five years of civil war. And what they did was they decided to go to the theater, famous Ford's Theater, to see a play, Our American Cousin. Hiding in the shade of, of history at this time was an actor, a well-known actor in the United States by the name of John Wilkes Booth. And John Wilkes Booth was very frustrated and very angry at what had taken place in the United States, especially with the policies of Abraham Lincoln. And he decided that what he would do is commit one unique dramatic act that would cause the world to rise up and set things straight. And what he did, as you know, when Abraham Lincoln was watching the show, Our American Cousin, he entered the booth that he was sitting in, and he aimed his gun, and he assassinated the president, who died several hours later. And much true to what John Wilkes Booth expected, the world did rise up, but it was a world of vengeance, a world of retribution, a world that took away any attempt at conciliation between the North and the South, and especially inflicting great harm on the chances of those people who had formerly been slaves to take their part as rightful citizens. About 75 years later, in 1914, in the city of Sarajevo, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife were going on a tour of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he was the heir apparent to the ruler of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And when he is driving in his open roof car through the city of Sarajevo, again, standing in the shadows of history. It's a young man, Gavriello Princip, belongs to a group of Serbian nationalists who feel that the Serbs are totally mistreated, have their rights taken away by the Austro-Hungarian rulers, and he too decides that he is going to commit one act, he's going to do something so dramatic that the world too will stand up and say, enough of this, and things will be set straight. And as you all know, what he did was to step off the sidewalk as the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife were in the car coming by. He fired three shots, one hitting the wife of the Austro-Hungarian future ruler, and to hitting him. And again, true to what he had thought, the world did rise up in outrage as to what took place, except the world that rose up was a world of nationalism and a world of militarism. And because of that, it brought on the horror and destruction of World War I, something no one had ever anticipated and no one had ever dreamed of something on that scale happening. We're here today because in 1938, as part of the national program of the Nazi party instituted by Adolf Hitler, and by part of his nationalism program, about 12,000 Polish Jews living in Germany were expelled. They were sent to the town of Svanchin on the border of Germany and Poland. The Germans didn't want them. The Poles weren't happy about taking them. And they lived a rather destitute existence for a short period of time, not having enough food, medical supplies, or even a decent place in which to sleep. 
again, in the shadow of history, is a young man, 17 years old, by the name of Samuel Greenspan, whose mother and father is one of these 12,000 Jews that have been expelled from Germany, are in this no man's land. And he's distraught over what is taking place, and he decides he too knows the answer to solving the problems. And he goes to see his uncle, and his uncle lends him what's the equivalent of $45, according to history, and he goes out and he buys a gun. And he knows exactly what he's going to do. He goes to the German embassy in Paris, and he is looking for the German ambassador to France because he knows that this is the man who once I kill him, everything will be fine. He does not find the German ambassador, but what he finds is the third vice consul at the German embassy, Ernst von Rath, who until now would be less than a memory in history. One of those people who was there, that was there, but we never even think about him. And he finds him and he shoots him five times. He, is, he doesn't run out, he is immediately taken prisoner by the people in the embassy and word of what he does is made public and once again in history, the world rises up in outrage. But except in this case, the world that rose up in outrage was the world of the Nazi Germany. It was the world of the murderers, the sadists, the demagogues, and they have taken great affront to what Greenspan has done because it has brought home the truth to them. It says to the people of Nazi Germany, you see what our Fuhrer was telling us, those people, those people who control the world, those people who stabbed us in the back during World War II, causing us, during World War I, causing us to lose the war, look what they've done. They've gone in and killed a leader of the Aryan race, and we are not going to stand for this. And as a result, Kristallnacht started. There was a well-organized, spontaneous outbreak of violence against the Jewish community of both Germany and Austria. We call it Kristallnacht because the historians looked back and saw all of the broken glass that had been spread on the streets from the shops and windows of Jewish businesses and homes. They saw the world the world saw the synagogues that had been destroyed. Over a thousand synagogues had been burned and destroyed both in Germany and Austria. And what this finally meant is it's time to go ahead with Germany, Nazi Germany's proposal that it's time to clean the world and set it straight. We're here today to celebrate the 71st anniversary of that event, Kristallnacht. It takes on a very special meaning here today at the Kupferberg Center at Queensborough Community College because what we're doing here today is not an event where we're going to sit here and wring our hands and say, as my mother used to say, Ay vey, is mere, what happened to us, look at this. We're moving past that today. We're moving past that today because what we have here is a much younger generation. And what we want to say to them is that we want you to be aware, to be aware of exactly what happened on November 9th, November 10th, in both Germany and Austria. But not only do we want you to be aware, we want you to know that there is a way of addressing situations that come up like this, and that forms the core of what we're doing at the Holocaust Center. You're going to see by a program today how we go about this. What I'd like to do now is call on Jerry Bloom, and our next number, the Temple Beth Shalom Teen Chorus and Choir. Hi, you heard our chorus doing, um, you've got to be carefully taught. We're now going to do selections from Brundi Bar. I'd like to introduce to you Elisa Wadler, who will tell you a little bit about the opera. So you 
you'll be listening to selections from Hans Krause's Brundy Bar. This is a children's opera that was composed in Prague, actually, in 1938 by Hans Krause. He was asked by a Jewish children's orphanage to compose a children's opera for the children at the orphanage. And he wrote this opera. It was performed once at the orphanage. And then he was sent, Krause, the composer, was sent to Terezin concentration camp in 1941. And there, he was also sent with the children from the orphanage. And at Terezin, people knew that the children had performed his opera. And they said, could you recompose it? He didn't have his music. Could you recompose the opera so that the children can perform it here at Terezin and try to bring some happiness to their lives at this concentration camp? And he recomposed it. And it was performed about 55 times at Terezin between 1942 and 1944. He was sent to Auschwitz along with all the children uh, who were in the opera. In, 19, in October of 1944, and he did not return, nor did most of the children. But we're so lucky to have his music, and you'll be hearing just a few selections from the opera by Temel Beth Shalem's Children's Choir. <laughs> my daddy long ago. I lead my sister, dear Annette. Our sick mother is home in bed. Doctor came in, the day was cold. He wore big glasses, he sat down next to mommy's bed with, with his cold, cold hand he touched it. After a while in lower voice he said to us don't make such noise milk and sleep the your mother's need Go buy some for her Go indeed Milk and sleep That's your mother's need Go buy some for her Go indeed Milk and sleep That's your mother's need How can we buy some
my darling little friends, our opera now ends. It's getting very late. You must go home, but wait. Don't say good night as yet. We'll send you on your way when we have sung once more our song with you today. We won a victory over the tyrant me. Sound trumpets, beat your drums, and show us your esteem. We won a victory since we were not fearful. Since we were not tearful. Because we marched along singing our Next on our program, we have one of the great assets of the Holocaust Center, and that is the fact that when we teach our students about the Holocaust, we have the advantage of telling people that we're going to show you someone and introduce you to someone who was actually there. Uh, when I first started teaching history, I used to think if only George Washington could come into my classroom and tell us how the country got started, how much more effective that would be. And one of the people that we have is a member of a group that comes in every other Friday morning. We call the, we, we call the group originally Bagels, Books, and Talk, but we decided it was more important for us to talk and have the bagels, so we dropped the word books, and now we call the group Bagels and Talk. We have about 15 to 18 men and women, all Holocaust survivors, who get together and we talk about whatever seems to come up in our minds. And if you would have been with us last Sun Friday morning, uh, we reviewed a film that we're showing at the Holocaust Center this Tuesday called The Purim Spieler, a Yiddish film uh, that was very, very well received. But I'd like to call up one of the people who uh, was there and who experienced what took place on Kristallnacht, and that's one of our survivors, Herman Haller. Herman? Good afternoon. November 9th is the 71st anniversary of Kristallnacht. I would like to share with you some of my personal experiences and some, and some of the events that led up to this tragic episode in history, which was beginning of the Holocaust. Even though I was only 14 years old at the time, I will, I will never forget the shattering of glass of the Jewish shops and the burning of synagogues. My mother's sister lived next door to a synagogue and my mother was very concerned of my aunt, who had two little children, three and five years old. We had tried all night to get in touch with her, but to no avail. But the next morning, my mother asked me to take my bike and ride down to my aunt's house to find out what was going on there. As soon as I went outside, I saw the destruction of the neighboring Jewish on the shops. The street was littered with glass. Down the streets where I lived was a synagogue which was located on the first floor of a building. All the benches, prayer books, and Torah scrolls were laying in the street and burning. When I arrived near my aunt's home, I saw a large crowd in front of their building. Her shop was totally destroyed. My aunt lived in an apartment behind the store, 
and adjacent to her building was a large synagogue. It was the synagogue where my parents and many of my relatives were married. The synagogue was engulfed in flames. The firemen were dousing water on the adjacent building so that they would not catch fire, and the police were standing by and watching. I found out from bystanders that all people that lived in the building were safely evacuated, and I also learned that my aunt and her family were safe, were safe with neighbors. I returned quickly and reported to my mother. What could, what could have caused such a horrible event to take place in the 20th century in a so-called cultured industrial country? The event leading up to Kristallnacht was very carefully planned. It was a plan that was carefully thought out in Berlin by the highest Nazi officials to make Germany Judenrein, free of Jews. Germany's Jewish population was 500 to 600,000 by November 1938. Since the Nazi takeover in 1933, only 30,000 Jews had left Germany, a process much too slow for the Nazis. As soon as the Nazis came to power in Germany, they passed the so-called Nuremberg Laws. They dismissed all Jewish civil servants like teachers, clerks, judges, and lawyers. Doctors were not permitted to practice medicine on non-Jews. Jewish children were not allowed to attend public schools and had to attend only Jewish schools. Jewish people were not allowed to go to, the public, to public parks, and there were signs posted saying, dogs and Jews are not allowed entrance. Store owners, and the, and the, post special, the store owners had to post special signs on their doors and windows to identify themselves as Jewish owners. Males who used the name had to use the surname Israel in front of their, na of their surname, and women owners had to use the name Sarah in front of their surname. All Jews had to declare all their possessions, like stocks, bonds, bank accounts, etc. Any transaction thereafter had to be reported to the Nazi authorities. Life in Germany became intolerance for Jews. And this was only the beginning of what was to follow. Our greatest concern as survivors of the Holocaust is that soon no one will be left to tell what happened during this Nazi regime from 1933 to 1945. We as survivors are most grateful to people like the Kupferberg family and Dr. Marty and so many people of goodwill who had the foresight to support the building of a resource center on the campus of Queens Community College. The students and the surrounding community can learn the lesson of, of intolerance from, of, from the Shoah. We, the survivors, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. That's the call. Huh? I mean, he, he wants to take a picture. Good. Herman, thank you so much. Uh, the challenge that Herman gave us, if you look on any of the literature we have, we always have the answer to that challenge, and it says, when the last survivor is gone, who will tell of the Holocaust? That's the challenge we accept, and we do it every day. In meeting that challenge, we have to be creative. Uh, we have to call in assets that we seldom use before and make them a common way of understanding the Holocaust. And in doing that, we've added someone new to our staff this year, Ayala Tamir, the assistant director of the Kupferberg Center, and I'd like to call her to the microphone. Thank you for that lovely introduction and welcome everyone uh, for being here on this very special day. 
Um, with the the launching of um, with the the building of the of the Kafferberg Center, we've launched a new program, the Arts Initiative. This project uh, incorporates all art modalities into learning about the Holocaust and other genocides around the world. Through this initiative, the Kafferberg Center will integrate artists, musicians, performing and media artists in its mission to educate about the Holocaust. Today, we are fortunate to have a group of young musicians with us, Motil. Motil has joined the Kufferberg Center Arts Initiative as artists in residence and will be making their debut performance at the Kufferberg Center in just a few moments. The Motil Chamber Ensemble has formed in 2003 and performs music by composers whose lives were cut short or radically transformed by the Holocaust. The ensemble's name, Check for Butterfly, is derived from the poem, The Butterfly, written by Pavel Friedman at the Terezin concentration camp. Mutil has performed at major New York venues, including Carnegie Hall, the Tribeca Performing Arts Center, the Center for Jewish History, the Museum of City of New York, New York University, Stony Brook University, and at numerous art galleries. Additionally, they are the winner of the Artist International Chamber Music Competition, and has been and have been supported by generous grants from the New York State Council on the Arts. This winter, the ensemble will be featured on two Leonardo production CD releases and can also be heard on ORT's Music of the Holocaust website, launched earlier this year. These five young musicians have taken this moment in history, the Holocaust, exploring it through music, showing us the power music has and continues to have in preserving and honoring lives lost, as well as in celebrating and remembering traditions kept. I will now introduce Aliza Wadler of Motil, who will talk of the next piece they will play. Aliza? Thank you, Ayala. So the next piece that you will hear was composed by Hans Gall. He was a composer from Vienna. And he was very popular, he was very successful, and he was actually asked to come and direct the Conservatory of Mainz in Germany in 1929. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, same year that we're talking about today, he was dismissed from his position at the Conservatory. He returned to Vienna, and he was okay there until 1938, when the Nazis entered Austria, and he was no longer safe in Austria. From there, he fled to England, and he survived the war by being in England. And he continued composing in England, and actually um, he didn't have the same success that he had in his home country, but he did compose, and he was a professor at a university. And he also wrote books on composers. The piece you're going to hear, the variations on a theme by Mozart, actually takes a theme by Mozart from Don Giovanni. It's when Don Giovanni is, is singing to Donna Elvira's maid and trying to seduce her. So Hans Gau takes that theme and turns it into a variations, many variations for a string quartet. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
we have such wonderful programs. And one of the reasons we have such wonderful programs is we have people who are willing and to come out and support us and not just say, you guys are doing a great job, keep it up, and then disappear. But we have people uh, who assist us. And one of the people I want to call up who really has gone out of her way to make us a success here, Senator Toby Stavisky. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you for everything that, uh, that you do for uh, the center here. It was a couple of weeks ago where we gathered in this very room to dedicate the center and to talk about why it was so important, why it played such a significant role uh, in the life, the community life of Queens College. Arthur earlier said that he was a history teacher. So was I many years ago. Uh, and so was my husband. Leonard had a PhD in history from American history from Columbia. And many, many years ago, he directed an oral history program at City College. And in a sense, this is just a continuation of that kind of program where we're hearing from primary sources, from people who were there. Uh, you remember there used to be many years ago an, a television program called You Are There? I think it had, I think it was Edward R. Murrow. But that's what you're doing here at the center today and that's why I'm so delighted not only as the legislator for this, who represents uh, Queensboro, and I must say Dr. Marti has been such a wonderful uh, addition to the Queens, commu Queensboro Community uh, College, but also because, and I chair the Higher Education Committee in the, in the State Senate, but as a teacher, we've got to remind today's children time and again of what happened, and that hatred, whether it takes place in College Point, or Fort Hood, or the Middle East, is something that we have to eradicate. So I thank you, Mr. Haller, and I have a certificate for ra ra the rabbi. Uh, and I'm just so proud of everything that you do here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toby. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, I'm now going to call the uh, Temple Beth Shalom Youth Choir and Teen Chorus back on the stage. Uh, when we put together this program, I said, this is a song you have to sing. My Bubby sang it to me, my mother sang it to me, I sang it to my kids, and I'm trying to get them to sing it to their kids. Not much success, but I'm trying. The Temple Beth Shalom Teen Choir and Chorus. Have some. My own chazan is here today, uh, back by popular demand. All of you remember Marty from the last Crystal Knock performance and the one before that and the one before that. And Cantafuse will be joining with the uh, <coughs> Beth Shalom Chorus. Was 
Dem Golle schleppen, euch gemutet sein. Sollt ihr ihn für die äußeres Keuch schleppen, guckt in der See rein. Meine Schwester und Brüder, my sweet brothers and sisters, we are here again. The year flew so fast, and we will sing this beautiful song. Unser Städtel brennt. Our beautiful and dear town is burning. Can you hear me in the back? You know what, maybe another microphone will no. help. And I would ask uh, my wife, Leslie, to join me. I would like her to read for you the translation. This song was written by Mordechai Gewirti, Gewirti, following the program in the Polish town of Prostyak. Say it correctly, Prostyak. In 1938, Mordechai Gewirti wrote the moving song which was to prove prophetic. prophetic. Unfortunately, he was right. Gewürdig was a popular Yiddish songwriter before the war who continued to write and compose and composed uh, songs in Krakow get. He was murdered by the Germans on June 4th, 1942. My sweet brothers and sisters, every time I sing this song, and unfortunately I do it quite a bit, I remember that with this burning of the Kristallnacht, books were burned, synagogues were burned, and brothers and sisters were burned, and with them, beautiful songs they never wrote. My Stettele Brent. Brothers, our poor town is burning. Raging winds are fanning the wild flames and furiously tearing 
destroying and scattering everything. Everything is burning and you stand by and look on with folded arms. You stand and look passively while our town is burning. Our town is burning. Tongues of flames have almost consumed the whole town and the raging winds howl. The moment is at hand when, God forbid, our town along with all of us will be turned to ashes by the flames and only bare black walls will remain as after a battle. Our town is burning and only you can save it. Extinguish the fire with your very blood. If you must, don't just stand there, brothers, with folded arms. Don't stand, put out the fire. Our little town is burning. If you happen to know part of the song, the refrain, you're welcome to join me. Starker noch wie die wilde Flammen, als darum schön brennt. Und ihr steht und guckt das so sich mit verlangte Hände. Und ihr steht und guckt das so sich mit verlegte Es brennt, Bridalach, es brennt. O unser Ohr im Städtelnebel brennt. Es haben schon die Feierzungen das ganze Städtel eingeschlungen. Und die Beise winden hodgen, unsere Städtel brennt. Und ihre steht und guckt, da so es ist, mit verlegte Hände. Und ihre steht und guckt, da so es ist, unser Unsere Stadt mit uns zusammen soll auf Eich weg in Flammen bleiben soll, die noch a Schlacht, nur puste schwarze Wind. Und ihr steht und guckt da so sich mit verlegte Hände. Und ihr steht und guckt da so sich unser Unser Städtel brennt, brennt, Briderlach, brennt. Die Hilfe ist nur in Achalen gewählt. Oib das Städtele, ich is euch teile. Komm, nimm die Kehlen, lässt uns feiern. Lässt mit eier eigen Blut, beweist er, als ihr das Kind. Steht nicht, Brüder, und das so ist ich, 
mit verlegte Hand steht nie die Brieder, lässt das Feier unser, unser. Our town is burning, Bridalach. Don't stand there. Don't stand with empty hands. Do something. Do something. Unser Städtel Thank you, my brother and sister. Avromale, Dr. Arthur Flug, my sweet brother, you know his first name, he was known by Avromale. He didn't even know his name is Arthur. So Avromale said to me, you know, how about if the regular Holocaust songs that we usually sing, let's sing something that has hope in it, has hope. You know, from here, I'm going to the city. It's already uh, several years that I sing at the Yad Vashem dinner. And every year, unfortunately, I see less of the elderly, the survivors, but I see the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and what courage it takes to come from the Holocaust, to get married again, to have children. There is hope. There is hope. Ani Mamin, I believe with all my heart, in the time of the Mashiach, it will be a better world. The time of the Messiah. Ani Mamin. We'll sing it in two melodies. The first one is for my Rabbi, Reb Shlomo Kalibach, may he rest in peace. And the second one we'll sing with the regular melody that everybody knows. In Kinderlach, if you know the melody, would you join me, okay? The first, the second, whatever you know. to invite my friend Chazan Ofer Bainoi from Bet Shalom and Roslin to help me lead in the regular traditional Animamin. We believe that some of the Jews who went to in their last road, their last journey, sang this Animamin. Animamin. Ani mami, ani mami, bemona shema, bemiyat hamashiyat, bemiyat. 
This is my friend Menashe Glazer, my, our companies. The whole world is nothing but a narrow bridge, says Reb Nachman from Braslev. It's a world of trials, big trials, small trials. How are we tested? And how are you, my brothers and sisters, who survived? Oh, what a test. What a test it was. But we crossed the, this bridge, and there, on the other side, on the other side, is hope, is a better world, is the world of the Mashiach. Kol ha'olam kulo, gesher tsarmot, do not be afraid, my friends. It is going to be a better world, please, God. This is what we hope for. be afraid. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. At this point in our program, we not going to have any more singing just at this point, and we're not going to have any more music, but we're going to take time out for this point of our program to recognize two individuals who have worked closely, not only with the Holocaust Center, but have worked very, very closely with all of the community, and in this case, I mean all of the community uh, in New York, New York State. One of the people who we have developed a relationship with that has grown and grown and is someone uh, who just connected with us in what we're trying to do is the New York State Commissioner on the Division of Human Rights, Galen Kirkland. And I'd like to ask him to come up and Dr. Marti for the presentation of the first ever Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center Award for Social Service. Dr. Marti. Well, I think it's very fitting that uh, this award goes to Commission Kirtland. Uh, you know that we have done it. You know that we finally have a beacon of civility that will shine forever at the entrance of this college. You have done it. We have it. Now we have to use it. And I think it's very important that
that we celebrate the individuals who have helped us do it. The gentleman that stands behind me right now and is going to receive this award is a gentleman who came forth and recognized that at Queensborough Community College, we were using the lessons of the Holocaust to combat institutionalized prejudice. And the next step is to combat prejudice at all levels. So once we started doing that, and the city of New York recognized that we could do something like that, Commissioner Kirkland said, well, why not the state? And uh, he brought the state of New York to our hate crimes unit. He has been a consistent supporter of this center. And for that, I am going to uh, ask Arthur to come forward and present this first award. Thank you, Arthur. Our award reads as follows, the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives. The center presents to Commissioner Kirkland, New York State Division on Human Rights, in recognition of his dedication in fostering a never-ending community commitment to human betterment and the legacy of the Holocaust, Queensborough Community College, Kristallnacht's commemoration, November 8, 2009. Commissioner Kirkland. Thank you very much, Dr. Marti and Dr. Flug. I am deeply honored to receive this award from the Kupferberg. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now? I am deeply honored to receive this award from the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. I wish that there was no reason to have a Holocaust Center, that humankind had not lost its way to engage in the negation of what makes us different from animals. Our awareness of the human capacity to embrace evil so totally gives us all a mandate to nurture the best human instincts whenever and wherever we can. This means exalting kindness, compassion, and love not just competition, power, and success. To honor these highest human instincts in the allocation of social rewards would be the most potent vaccine against hate crimes and genocide. December 10, 2009 is the 61st anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1948. That manifesto for human dignity was framed at a time when the world was trying to overcome the horror of World War II and the Holocaust. Eleanor Roosevelt was a driving force behind this attempt to create an international constitution that would help us evolve beyond the reach of the abject evil that it so recently attempted to dominate the world. Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, and I quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. When I read the text of this noble document, I cannot help but feel a profound sense of sadness combined with inspiration because of how earnest was the intent and how irrelevant it is to what is happening in the world today. Somehow, we must find a way to make the words never again a reflection of how far we have evolved in protecting human rights. Thank you so much for including me in this very special moment, 
and for this recognition. I do this work because it is the only way that I can participate in this world without feeling complicit in the continuum of, inju of injustice that we see. I look forward to continuing to work with the Kupferberg Holocaust Center to help realize our aspiration for a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, this morning did not start off well for me. I got a call early this morning from Rabbi Schoenfeld saying, Arthur, there's a problem. And being, I guess being a rabbi is like being a doctor. You never know what's going to happen when the phone rings. And he said to me, uh, I have two funerals today. And, uh, you know, so if you take a look at the service your congregation or the service here, I knew where we stood. And I was willing to go ahead and tell all these wonderful things about Rabbi Schoenfeld and present it to him in absentia. But he said, if I could make it, I will. And he's here. And uh, I'm delighted that he's here. Uh, I've known Rabbi Schoenfeld for many years. I look at him not only as a friend, but a teacher. I've learned so much from him, not only in discussions, but once I showed up early in the morning to pick up some material I had given to him uh, for a program he was doing at his synagogue regarding the Holocaust. And I went down to the basement, it was right off the, after the morning minion, after the morning prayers, and he was holding forth and I just sat down. And it was a hard fight to convince myself not to come there every morning at eight o'clock. It really was because it was absolutely wonderful. Rabbi Schoenfeld is a founder of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, a steady friend of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. And Rabbi, we'd like you to come up. This, this man sat with me in my office almost eight years ago, and he said, we can do this. And Rabbi, it is my honor to present to you this award, if I can get it open. <laughs> it says to Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld, who as a child of the Holocaust has imbued the greater Queens community with a sense of compassion for human decency, diversity, and the worth of the individual. Presented on this day, November the 8th, 2009, at Queensboro Community College. Rabbi, my honor. The problem with getting them awards is that you have to make a speech. But that's not my problem, it's your problem as well. Uh, Dr. Mari, Arthur Fluke, Commissioner, it is indeed a great honor for me. That's what my wife keeps saying. And when I do it, she says, What are you yelling for? You know? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, what I was saying is the the problem with awards is that you have to make a speech, and as bad as it is, it's worse for you. But um, it's a great honor for me, it really is. In the course of my life in the Revenant, which is over 60 years, I've received um, many awards, medals, what have you. But this is probably one of the most important and most precious to me. Because we live in a time when people not only do not want to know, they don't want to remember. How can you deny the Holocaust? When you go even today to Poland, as I go on occasion, to Auschwitz, to Treblinka, Sirpabir, and you see, and you meet people. I am an American speaking Holocaust survivor. I come from Vienna. And Hitler marched in in March of 1938. And what is striking for us to comprehend the impossible. Jews had lived in Vienna for 1,100 years. 
More or less in peace, sometimes there were attacks, sometimes there was anti-Semitism, there always is. But it was a, a good life. With yeshivas, day schools, Jewish education, universities, hospitals. If anybody here comes from Vienna, another one or two people will remember those days. And a thousand years of Jewish life were extinguished in one day. I'm not hyperbolic, I'm not exaggerating. Hitler marched in on a Friday, Erev Shabbat, Eve of Shabbos. The very next day, they were busy beating up Jews in the streets, picking them up and sending them to the one concentration camp that then existed in Dachau. And I myself had to witness how old rabbis were taken out of the synagogues, made to bend down on the floor, wash the streets, getting kicked. Rabbis in their 80s, maybe 90s. From that day on, Vienna was never the same, not even today. So you can extinguish important life in the course of one evening, hard to believe. In one night, they managed to destroy almost 1,100 years of Jewish life. God was good to our family, we were able to get out, and then eventually came to these blessed United States. God bless America. The tragedy with that Holocaust, and this is not a lecture, just a feeling I want to express, is that sometimes you see ruins of a house, ruins of a palace. You say, oh, this used to be the royal palace. This used to be a school. What the Nazis did was not simply to destroy, to create a condition as if these things never existed. When the prophet in the Bible says that your pain is as great as a ship that went down into the ocean. And the reason for it is, when you have a fire, you have a palace that burns, you can pass by and take your students in history and say, this is what it used to be. When a ship sinks, Nothing is left. There's no way of telling where the ship is. What the Nazis accomplished in doing is to erase Jewish life in Europe as if it never was. And that's the great tragedy. We all who live in Queens know about the Kitty Genovese incident. A young woman was walking in Kew Gardens, not Kew Gardens Hills, Kew Gardens on Austin Street, was attacked by gangsters and rough people and was killed eventually. And people in the windows saw it. Instead of calling the police, they shut the windows, they shut the ears. And everybody knows about the Kitty Genovese case. What happened then was, a woman was killed by ruffians and nobody said anything. And now you multiply this by six million. Six million people were killed and destroyed and massacred and no one No one in Europe said a word. They came back from Munich, Chamberlain, Peace Now a Time, all kinds of conferences were held. The only conference that succeeded was a conference in Wannsee in Berlin when the Germans decided the final solution of killing every Jew, every Jew, anywhere. If there were Jews in Alaska, they would go after them. If there were Jews among the Eskimos, they would go after them. Hitler wanted to destroy every single Jew. And the world stands by. If as recently as two weeks ago, the United Nations could issue a report about the cruelty, barbarian behavior of the Israeli army, the most noble, the most compassionate, the most humane army in the world, as many officers will tell you. And you go to the United Nations and call the Israeli army and its officers war criminals. And nobody says anything. To his credit, the United States voted against this. Ultimately, we rely on the United States for help. This is what the Holocaust is all about. Stand by and watch people get killed as if they don't mean me. They do. They mean every human being. So what we've done here is a great thing, not just for Queens, but for the entire civilized world. And I take this opportunity in conclusion to thank first and foremost Arthur Flug, a man of conscience, hard work, belief in the mission of the Jewish people to make the world a better place to live in. 
And Arthur, we are eternally grateful to you, all of us. The Kupferwerk family, of course. And then I want to say one special word to President Marty. President Marty is what is called in the Yiddish language a goy. He's a non-Jew. I don't know of any non-Jewish personality throughout the world who took the Holocaust and made it an important part of study for students in the college. There are many universities have chairs in Jewish studies, chairs in Holocaust, but here is Marty, Professor Marty, present Marty, giving his very, we say in Yiddish, neshama, his very soul to the success of this venture. Dr. Marty, we are proud of you. There's an expression in... In, in the Talmud, the Talmud takes it for granted the Jews are hated, the Jews suffer, the Jews are being persecuted. But those who help us have a special name called Chassidei Omat Olam, the righteous Gentiles of the world. There's a whole avenue dedicated to them in Jerusalem and Yad Vashem. If anybody deserves the Nobel Prize for remembering Jewish history, making sure it does not happen again, I would give it to Professor Dr. Edward Marty. Thank you so much. And Commissioner, I'm proud to be with you on the same program. I know of your accomplishments, and I know where you come from, and I know what you stand for. We are brothers together, all people. And as long as somebody suffers, I suffer. Somebody has pain, I have the pain. The trouble is the world doesn't see it this way. But be it as it may, this event today is historic in the life not only of the United States, not in the life only of Queens College, community college, in the life of interhuman relationships. Again, Arthur, so many, many things. And Dr. Marty, may God bless you. so much, by the way, actually the major part of this tribute is due to my wife who made her trouble to bring me here. She's not only my wife, you know, you can see I have certain disabilities now. She's my driver, she's my support. She really guides me in all the things that I do. When I came this morning, I said we have two funerals of two wonderful people in the congregation, one of them a survivor. I said, how am I going to make it? She said, Work it out, you'll make it, because you have to be there. Thank you. And we thank you also. Before we come to the close of our program, I'd like to call up Cynthia Zaliski, the Executive Director of the Queens Jewish Community Council, and Warren Hecht, the President of the Queens Jewish Community Council. Both of these people here have been my unsung partners in putting together a community program that supports the Holocaust Center. And we'd like to thank you very much and know that you're recognized and you have to smile for the fellow over here. Because if we don't take a picture, it didn't happen. Thank you. I want to join in thanking Arthur Flug, who's my partner, my friend and my partner, who's the only person I know who goes to work earlier than I do, and that's usually when I get him at about 8 o'clock in the morning. We, the Queens Jewish Community Council, feels very strongly of how important it is to have the Kufferberg Holocaust Center in Queens. I am a child of Holocaust survivors. And to me, it's extremely important. Not having my parents anymore to stand here, I have to stand for them. And I promise you, dear Mr. Haller, that as long as I'm alive, and as long as my children and I'm 
delighted to say great-grandchildren, so there are four generations, thank God, that are here, that we will never let the world forget the Holocaust. We will stand with you, Commissioner, and with everyone to, to battle hate, to destroy it, and as we like to say in Queens, hate has no place in Queens, and we'll make sure of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. And now, for our close, I'd like to ask the choir back. Thank you. We pray to God that genocide will never again be attempted against us or any other people, and that there will always be a haven for those displaced by war, famine, aggression, or natural disaster. <laughs> Last year, for those who were here last year, can you hear me well? 
Yeah. For those who were here last year, we had, uh, we recited the Kelma Rachamim, the memorial prayer was just following uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hyman. Some of you remember, and he showed us, Mr. Hyman showed us a talus that he saved from his burning synagogue. Even though it's not customary to wear a talus in a memorial service, I wore it. And I want to tell you, Kindalach, we felt it. It transformed us back. And I heard the sounds, the crying, and I saw the flames. I asked if Mr. Hyman could bring it again this year. And unfortunately, uh, before the program, I was told that he passed away. His wife is here, and I would like her to come and stand near me, together with other witnesses of the Kristallnacht. Kindly come, stand near me. And she promises me that, God willing, next year, she will bring it. I would like to start this tradition where we say the Kelmale Rachamim with that talus, with that talus. O oh God, full of compassion, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the souls of our brothers and sisters who perished in the Shoah, men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered, suffocated, burned, buried alive by the Nazis and their helpers from other nations. Our brothers and sisters, may their memory endure and inspire deeds of charity and goodness in our lives. May their souls be bound up in the bond of life eternal. May they rest in peace. And let us say, kindly rise. Oh, 
ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. Hatikva, the hope, the hope. Oh, <laughs> 